So this week, I'm delighted to be joined by Craig Barton. It's great to have you here, Craig. How are you? I'm very good, Kieran. Thank you. Yourself? Yeah, doing really well. I mean, it's an absolute honour to have you with us today. I'm really looking forward to this one. We always begin with our guests in numbers to get a feel for who they are. So my first question to you is years as a teacher. Yeah, I've had to write this down. This is a low point. So I um, started teaching in 2005. I had my last kind of full time table of 2019. So I think that's kind of 14 years full time and then kind of on and off since. Podcast episodes recorded? This was even trickier. I reckon about 220, something like that. Yeah, it's got to be ridiculous. I was going to ask how many hours that was, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to give you too much math homework. <laughs> First year group, Todd? A year eight class. They were bloody awful. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on this podcast, but they were, they were a tough one. Yep. Last year group, Todd? It was a very pleasant year 11 class. Most important year group? Definitely year seven, I would say. Um, I think it's underappreciated in secondary. I mean, I could go off on one here, but just to say very briefly, it tends to be the year group valued the least you tend to get. That's where mixed class, um, mixed split classes tend to happen with two different teachers or even three different teachers teaching a given year seven class. Often you'll get non-math specialists there because all the kind of, you kind of front load all your kind of strongest teachers on year 11 and you can, you can just never break the cycle. The reason year 11 need all this extra support is because they don't get it at key stage three and so on. It's, it's hard to break the cycle, but definitely year seven are your most important. Sounds like year seven are the equivalent of year three. You know, that yeah, bridge that's between interesting. infant and junior. Favourite year group? Yeah, I was thinking about this. It's a bit of a cliche to say, but the, the older students, they, they certainly tend to be easier to teach. You can reason with them more. Like I've had my favourite ever class was a year 11 class who, like it was a joke that I was being paid to teach them. I used to just stand there sometimes. And you know, you, you get this notion of flow. Like I'd, I'd just be doing an explanation or something and then I'd just see them working. And it sounds corny, I'm getting little shivers on, on, on me, me, me skin here, like my goose pimples. Because just, I thought, I'm loving every minute of this. These kids are listening, they're getting it, and this is an absolute pleasure. And that, that was my, I've had classes close to that, but there was something about that year 11 class, the mixture of characters, there was some, there was some tricky ones in there, but it was just, it was just a joy. And I just remember, yeah, thinking, I cannot believe people are paying me to do this. This is, this is all I ever imagined teaching to be. And then I go into the year 10 class next and think, right, I see why I'm being paid to do this now, because this is, this is a tough old job. That sounds brilliant. And tweets? Yeah, so <laughs> let me have a look at this for you, here, Kieran. This, I've not looked at this till you, till you asked this. So I've sent, oh, you know, I couldn't even tell you. I've, I've a lot of followers. I can tell you that. So I've, I've hit fifty thousand, which is nice. I'm in a bit of a um, a bit of a race with uh, Joe Morgan for this. Who uh, who can keep the most? She's catching me up pretty quickly. I've sent fifteen thousand. So yeah, that's not too bad. A kind of tweet to follower ratio. I'm quite happy with that. That's all right. Then. Yeah, that's probably mid table because I ask quite a lot of our guests, if not all of them, you know, how many tweets they've sent. I think uh, you're talking north of a hundred thousand for the most, and look close to a thousand for the least. So. Table, yeah, quality, not quantity with me here and there. That's what I've gone for. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you one thing just quickly about Twitter. This annoys me. So I um, have a bit of a love-hate relationship with Twitter. Like, I tweet some out and you get abuse left, right and centre. But I'm one of these who's a bit of a addicted to kind of likes and retweets. I judge the quality of anything I do based on that. If I tweet a maths resource out or an idea, maybe I'll get, you know, 30, 40 likes, whatever. Tweet a picture of, like, one of my little boys. It's going through the roof. I'm thinking, what? What are people looking for here? I'm trying to give the good stuff, so I, I need to fuse the two together. Maybe get my little boy to hold up a maths problem or something like that. Maybe that's the only way forward. But yeah, it tends to be tweet pictures of kids, you're laughing. Math stuff doesn't go down quite as well. But what can you do? Yeah, get some many whiteboards for the house. <laughs> <laughs> that's not bad. <laughs> so you're a teacher, author, podcast host, and I think source of inspiration for thousands of our colleagues across the world. I can't imagine there are many listeners who aren't aware of you and your work, but just in case someone is listening who does fall into that group, what would you like them to know about who you are and where you're from? Well, I mean, first thing to say, Kieran, I'm going to get you as my hype man, I think, before I do talk, so that's a very, very kind uh, kind introduction. Um, I don't know, just just some... <sighs> I just see myself these days as, as always just trying to learn and get better. And whether that's reading research, whether that's trying activities out that I write with kids, whether it's interviewing guests on the podcast or just kind of trying to write books and stuff, just 
just someone who realizes, and it took me a long time to realize this, that I have a lot to learn in teaching and I've been trying to kind of make up for it ever since. So yeah, someone who's, I think I'm fairly inquisitive and yeah, try and try and learn as much as I can and then communicate that in, in an easy to digest form, I guess. Well, that's probably the best way to be, I think. Yes, solid answer to that one. I'm going to try and ask as many questions as possible because obviously, I, you know, I'm trying to pick your brain as much as I can. So I think if we start with mathematics, mm. and I ask this to everyone who has a sort of mathematics specialist, and just to see if I can gather lots of different answers to it. Why is a high quality mathematics education so important? Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I'm biased, obviously, with, with this one. It's maths is all, is, is all I know. I mean, I did an economics degree, but I, I saw the light fairly quickly. Like, maths, maths is my, my, my passion in life. I, th I think it's important. It gives, there's a clarity to maths that perhaps isn't true of, of other subjects and a, and a conciseness. I think that's what I like about it. Some of the most beautiful mathematical solutions aren't the ones that take up three or four pages. They're the ones where you see an insight and you just you get to the answer in a, in a truly, truly beautiful way. And I think that, that's what's always appealed to me about it, that there's elegant ways of, of doing mathematics, that you know, the most complex thing can, can condense into something so, so simple. And I think that's what I really like about it. I think in, in all walks of life, being clear and concise are two really important virtues. And I think math kind of exemplifies that for me. So that, that would be why, why I'm, a, I'm a big fan of it anyway. Do you think all pupils, all people can achieve an understanding of mathematics in that way with the clarity and the, and the beauty? Yeah, ooh, that's, a, that's a biggie. Um, I mean, I, I certainly don't want to go down the line of, you know, ability versus achievements and, and so on and so forth. But I think to, to different levels, certainly all students can be shown the beauty of maths and I think can appreciate the beauty of maths. You've just got to be careful how you pitch things. And the other thing about maths, and you'll know this far more than me and, and your primary colleagues listening to this will, will know as well. It doesn't take much to put kids off maths. And, it, you know, if you go in at the wrong angle or the wrong pitch, or it's just they feel a failure early on and so on. It doesn't take much to knock them off that path and then it's a big old struggle to, to, to get them back on. So I would never try and enforce a certain way of, of thinking about maths on, on a student. It's about, I mean, it's obvious stuff, but finding where they're at and trying to find ways to show them that the level they're working at now, there's still beauty, there's still wonder, there's still awe in that mathematics. So I think it's doable, but it's um, it's tricky. And it's certainly not the case that it's only proofs that are beautiful. You can find, you know, you can find beauty in, in the most simple, sim simple things. In it. I mean, I'll give you an example. So my little boy, my, I've got two little boys. My old eldest is, is three and a half. Um, and we're, we're, we're chatting about numbers left, right and centre. And I'm trying, I mean, again, your listeners will think I'm completely out of my depth here because I don't know a thing about early years maths. I am clueless. So at the moment, we were, he, he's obsessed with numbers. He's always wanted, when he goes to sleep, he's always counting. But it's that classic thing where if I'm trying to get him to realise that if he's got three things and he adds another on, he doesn't have to start again and go one, two, three, four. And it was just literally last night, I think he's starting to see that for the first time. And he couldn't believe his eyes. He could not believe it, that if I said to you at three and I give you one more, that he could say it was four without having to do the counting. And that would just be a tiny example of, of the beauty of mathematics, that you can find these elegant ways of doing things, even at that level. And I think that transfers right across, right up to, you know, further maths in, in, in year 13. So, yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Totally agree. Three and a half is a great year. If the literature is to be believed, you know, that's when things like supertizing become possible. Um, and, you know, you, you start exploring counting like you are. And, um, you know, those early precursors to arithmetic or arithmetic reasoning. Um, but there are some videos of very, very young infants or babies, potentially. And when they see or they notice that something has disappeared, you know, they, they spend more time watching the, um, the space where it should have been. And, um, you know, when they don't expect this, it's almost like, you know, even from a very, very young age, people can see that something mysterious is, is happening around them. Yeah, so I'm totally that's it. I'll tell you what, Kieran, let me ask. I, I, you know I'm going to keep asking you questions throughout this. I'm, I'm terrible <laughs> for it because it's far easier asking them than, than answering them. I did a series of, um, of episodes for my Mr. Bar Maths podcast with researchers from Loughborough University um, about you know um, their, their areas of research of maths for all age groups. And, and one of them was a fascinating conversation about the 
the words that we use in English for numbers and how obviously like 11 to 20 is just a nightmare waiting to happen because it's not, you know, 10, 1, 10, 2 and so on and so forth. So my, my little boy, Isaac, he's got to grips with 1 to 20. He's all over them. But we are, um, we're playing snakes and ladders and he's, he does something really interesting first. And I'm sure this is common, but I, I couldn't get my head around this. Like he'll see 63. And he'll read it as three six, and I don't know why he says the units. Is that is first? I've got two questions here. Is that a common thing to, to for some reason to read the the digits the other way around? When we've worked with people, you know, for instance, say we think they may have issues with them um, with reading or with letter formation writing. Typically, you can't really ex explore it until they're about seven years old, because it's only if they're still doing things they got after they're seven then it might be something. You know, so yeah, I think it is fairly typical. I mean, my youngest, he's five now, and he would always skip 14 when counting. You know, even just reciting the number names. And yeah, yeah. no matter how often I said to him, you know, okay, let's do it again together. Yeah, he wasn't having it. 14 wasn't a number to him. So <laughs> I think these things are totally normal. Okay, I'll relax there. But this is a good one. So <laughs> he likes a bit of a joke, Isaac. So he, once we've got like 22, 23 and so on, he'll then say, when we get to the 30s, you know, he knows it winds me up, he'll say, 34 instead of 34 and I have a big grin on his face but then last night he thought he was doing a good joke because then he said because he'll do it for like um 56 and stuff instead of 56 but then as a laugh last night he went 47 and he and then it just got me thinking how annoying is our number system right where you know like the 40s work nice and then so then we think what other numbers work and then he goes is it 66 and it's just it's hard work, isn't it? Like, well, that's why I take my hats off to, to primary colleagues, because flipping out, just trying to think about these numbers, it's, yeah, it's interesting, but it's, it's tough It's tough going. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Bernie Westacott always talks about how in Welsh, even 10, 11, 12, they're direct, you know, I think it's 110 and 1, 110 and 2, that kind of thing, you know, it just makes so much more sense. It does, it does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Many of our listeners cross the primary secondary divide. I think we're quite fortunate that we've got a lot of people who are open to learning from each other. And they often talk of school mathematics, like Stuart Welsh from sort of Complete Maths, who talk about school mathematics rather than phases. How do you feel about this outlook and what might the pros and cons be? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love it in principle. It's just, it's just very, very difficult. And I, I think secondary teachers have, have quite a lot to answer for here. I'll, we'll probably dive into this a little bit later, this, this this kind of reset that seems to happen at the start of start of year seven. I mean, obviously the dream is that you get this smooth, you know, transition, this continuation that, you know, the math you're learning in year six just increases slightly in year seven and, and so on and so forth. It's hard. I think what, what I'm certainly seeing in secondary now, and it's, I think White Rose have, have, have done a lot of good work here because a lot of secondary schools are adopting White Rose for their key stage three curriculum, particularly if the kids have done White Rose um, at key stage two. It, it does seem to be a bit of a smoother transition. So it's probably fine to start talking about kind of, you know, school mathematics in, in that sense. But I think whenever you don't have that continuity and then you chuck onto the mix on top of that, the fact you've got a new teacher, you're in a new environment and so on, you're bound to get this disjointedness. But it certainly makes a lot more sense to think about, you know, an 11 year journey through mathematics or whatever it may be. But yeah, you, you, you tend to get these. Again, I apologise, Yuki, another question for you. Would the key stage one and two, would there be a jolt between those two there? Or is, that, is, that, is, is it fine to talk about kind of primary mathematics all the way through? It's a very good point. I think in a lot of cases, you probably would find a jolt, particularly when you've got an infant and a junior school who don't work closely together. So I've seen both instances, um, like my boys go to an, an infant school, one's moving to a junior school next year, and I can see the transition, you know, it's almost as if they're in the same school, but two different sites. But there will be times when they do restart or when we had levels, a level three mathematician at Key Stage 1 wasn't considered a level three mathematician at at uh, key stage two and you know you so whatever they're using to describe those those sort of states of being now they will you know they'll they'll argue over them so you know i think it's not necessarily all on secondary teachers you know because i think if we at primary prioritize what is essential and you know for instance if we don't rush through like we used to have to and we say okay if we give you a really basic and fundamental grounding in number then that opens up a lot of doors further down the line. So you guys can do the stuff in secondary that, you know, because there's a lot of stuff I think it's fun to teach. I mean, it's fun to teach them um, all the different calculations of fractions. You know, there's some really profound truths. You're talking about the beauty, 
there's nothing more beautiful than multiplication and scaling. You know, when you see what the multiplication of two fractions is compared to how easy the process is. But I'd be happy to let that happen in year seven, eight, and nine, and we can focus on on the on the core. Really, I think yeah. So I think everybody needs to sort of speak more. You know, I think that sort of leads into my next question. If we wanted to encourage greater collaboration, how might we go about it? Yeah, th this is an interesting one. This, I, th I think, I don't know about your experience, but my experience of, of that transition is, is really, it's poorly done. It's really poorly done. It Best case, it tends to involve either the year six kids coming into school some point in the summer after sat sometime in the summer term and doing like taster lessons and they're, they're just a joke honestly like the maths they do in those taster lessons i will tell you now is nothing like the maths they're going to be doing in year seven that, that that's a fact or it'll go the other way around and it's the year it's the secondary school teachers going into primary and it's almost like all right we're coming in as the experts here you know we know what to do and Again, I've, I've seen some of the best lessons I've seen over the last few years have, have, have been primary lessons. Some of the most challenging lessons I've seen have been, you know, year five and year six lessons. The, the easy answer, it's easy to say, but hard to implement, is that teachers need to see each other in their own environments as, as much as possible. So secondary school teachers need to spend time in year six classrooms, not with any agenda or anything like that, but just, just to learn, learn the mathematics that, that's happening, learn the way, you know, that it's been taught. Jo Morgan did a fantastic uh, video that she put out, it's on YouTube, that she uh, put out about, aim for secondary teachers, about the maths that happens at Key Stage 2. You know, it's called something like what your year sevens have experienced or something like that. And honestly, Kieran, it's mind blowing. It's mind blowing if, if you're not aware of the, of the you know, programs of study, because, of course, you know, you're multiplying, you know, fractions by whole numbers. You're doing, you know, wonderful things with, with, with decimals, you know, met the mean, all, all these kind of things that in, in, years, in most year seven schemes of work. Many teachers treat as if, you know, they're the most mind blowing concepts a kid's ever met in their life. And it's, it's scary. But it needs to happen both ways as well. I think that. Uh, I mean, this may sound big-headed, but I think, you know, primary colleagues would, would learn a lot from spending time in secondary secondary colleagues' classrooms, again, with no agenda, just as a CPD opportunity. And it strikes me that it's it's one of the cheapest CPD opportunities you can have. You know, forget paying two or three hundred quid to go you know, to go a hotel in London and, you know, some, some course led by someone who hasn't taught for 20 years or whatever. You know, go if you can arrange a little swap with your local primary just for, you know, a lesson or something like that, get some cover, get SLT to sit in on your class or something like that you would learn so much and then feed it back to your colleagues and everything. So it's just, for me, it's spending time in each other's classroom with no agenda as much as possible. And we, we know ourselves, Kieran, you learn so much when you see somebody else teach. And particularly if it's in a different environment, in a different phase, you're bound to pick up on things that you would not see. You'd not be able to come up with yourself. So that's the easy solution, but easy things are often hard to implement. But that, that's, that's the only way to do it, in my opinion. It's not going to cost the earth either, is it? So maybe I might say to some of our regular school leaders who I chat with on a Wednesday or Wednesday night, you know, is that something they can do, especially now COVID has uh, sort of, you know, in terms of the restrictions anyway, you know, there, there are certainly less on, on sort of visiting other schools and things, I think. I, I think so. Yeah, just uh, again, just sorry to sorry to put in just on this. I'm a bit obsessed with this idea of visiting other schools. I interviewed um, Sonia Thompson for, for the Tips for Teachers podcast a while ago. This was one of her tips, visit other schools. And it's, you feel a bit awkward, like, you know, who am I, what do I do? I'm like a classroom teacher, do I just email the head teacher or whatever? And I said to her, like, as a head yourself, what would cause you to say, if you received a random email, what would make, if someone wanted to visit your school, what would make you say yes? And she said, if they had a genuine reason, if they said, you know, I've, I've heard your school does group work really well, it's something I really struggle at, would you mind if I just came in for an hour, two hours, whenever fits in with you, and if you want, if you find it useful, your colleagues can come and spend some time with me, she said, of course I'd say yes, why, why, would, I, why would I say no to that, it's, it's free CPD, it's, it's good for the teachers who are being watched to have a think about, you know, how they deliver things, have a, have a conversation afterwards, and it's great for them to, the, to then revisit, and as long as it's done in a low stakes kind of friendly way. For me, it's just brilliant, but it just, it just, for whatever reason, it just doesn't happen. I mean, I've done talks in schools, like a bit like you were saying with the infants and juniors. I've done talks in secondary schools that have got a junior school literally on the same site. The teachers never collaborate. They never, and maybe they get together once a year or something to chat about targets or something like that, you know, but just popping into someone else's lesson in a different environment. 
I don't think there's anything better than that in terms of, you know, improving your teaching. So if you can find ways to facilitate that, and I think this mutual, you know, I'll come and watch you, you come and watch me, no agenda, no stakes, we just have a chat. I think that, that for me, it's, it, it doesn't get better than that. Convince me. I'm going to clip that bit. I'm going to push it every day <laughs> during September. See if we can get lots of people into engage with that kind of idea. Because I think, yeah, it would make a massive difference. And like you say, both recipient and the person delivering the lesson get so much from it, you know. Yeah, so absolutely with you. Sticking with professional development, and I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the distinction between pedagogical content knowledge and subject knowledge and when it's best to focus on either. Do you think there's ever a role for professional development that's purely subject knowledge based, perhaps for the sake of something like cognitive load management? Oh, yeah. Kieran, for me, it should be the majority. It really, really should. Like, I, I, I'll tell you that I'm terrible. When I go, oh, I, shouldn't be, I shouldn't be admitting this, but forget it, it'll be fine. Whenever I used to go into a CPD session and it was led by an English teacher or a history teacher, I used to switch off straight away. I'd be thinking, this isn't for me. This, you know, like, and that, that's, that's on me as, as you know, it's as, as, as my, my failing that. But I think, I, I mean, I'm biased. I think maths is quite unique. I think it's, it's quite special the way maths is taught. There are certain things, you know, worked examples, work very specifically in maths that perhaps doesn't translate to, to, to other, other, other domains. So the more subject specific CPD, the better. The flip side of that is, and this is, this is a decision I've, I've made, because often I get asked to do whole school sessions, you know, for, for secondary colleagues or whatever, and you'll, you'll have history teachers and English teachers there. So I'd be very hypocritical if I stood up there and said, do this in your English lesson, do this in your history lesson. So I always, firstly, I make the person who books me very clear that I'm clueless in anything outside of maths. And then I always make, what the decision I make when I, when I talk to teachers and other subjects is I say, look, I'm going to do something very deliberate here. What I'm going to try and do is describe exactly what I do in my maths lessons and why I do it. What I'm not going to do is try and guess what you should do in your lesson. That's on you because I, I just don't know. Nobody knows your kids, your subject, your constraints, your challenges, your opportunities as, as well as you do. So all I can do is try and describe what I do and why I do it. And then I'll throw it over to you. And then that's your job now to think, is there anything good in this idea? And if so, what would I need to change to make it work for me? And that's a big old challenge. But often that, and this is the kind of irony, that can often be more impactful because the teachers then have to put a bit more effort into thinking about it. That can be more impactful than if you go to a subject specific CPD and you think, all right, I'll just, I'll just do exactly what he's just said to me without realizing that actually, you know, your situation is different to, 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 the, uh, to, the, to the presenters, to, to the speakers. So I think subject specific CPD is, is a must. It's an absolute must because you can really get into the weeds of, of thinking about how something works. But if you're doing non subject specific CPD, if you're presenting it, I think you've got an obligation to not try and second guess, but to describe as clearly as you can what you do and why you do it. And if you're attending that CPD, and this is true of all CPD, the single biggest question you should have running through your head is, what would I need to change to make this work for me? And I think if you do that, I think you, you tend to get mu as much possible out, as, out of CPD. That, that, that'd be my thinking anyway. I'm really on board with asking people to think more about their practice. How do they respond when you make that shift? You know, are they on board or I suppose it depends on the context? Yeah, I think, well, I've, I've, I'm a bit obsessed with CPD. <laughs> so I've been thinking about this. If I was to do another book, it'd be called How I Wish I'd Delivered CPD. Because the more I think about it, I've not, I've not done it very well over the years. I was chatting to somebody on, on Tips for Teachers about this the other day, that a lot of what we know about effective practice. And in fact, Kim, we were talking about this when you were on my tips for teachers, how a lot of effective classroom practice doesn't seem to translate across to, um, to, 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 to CPD for some, for some weird reason. I've really tried to make a deliberate, deliberate shift um, when I'm thinking about that um, now. But in terms of how it comes across, I think the honesty is the key. Like, I think if, you, if you, you're clear from the outset that you are not pretending to know how to teach your colleagues, students in your colleague subject, they know far more about that than you do. But once you lay that out there and then you say, OK, but this is what I'm going to do, because I'm going to tell you exactly what I've done and why I do it. But then the challenge is on you. I think that's OK. I think where it doesn't go down well is if you don't make that explicit at the outset. And then all of a sudden people are watching me do a worked example on adding two fractions and they're thinking, what the hell is this? Why am I wasting my time? I'm an English teacher. Why am I wasting my time on this? So I think if you lay it out on the outset, you're going to, I think you're going to have a much better chance. And then, of course, the second component of that is 
you've got to leave time for discussion. If you do, if it's like, all right, watch me do a words example, right? Let's crack onto something else. Doesn't work at all. It's got to be then over to you guys. What do you think of that? What would you need to change to make it work for you? And that's when you start getting teachers generating those specific ideas that transform a maths tip or technique into something that can be applied in, in, in their subjects. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. You're almost telling them where they need to sort of spend or give their attention and then opportunity to reflect on that. You know, so that, that sounds, sounds wonderful. So I, I think if we sort of slightly move into research. Now, we've got this thing on Think and Deliver Primary Education where we call our, our research thunderbolt. And it's a, it's a reference to The Godfather where Michael meets his wife. And as soon as he saw her, it was like a thunderbolt come from the sky. The scales had fallen from his eyes. And he knew he was going to be with this woman for the rest of his life. And so it's, it's that paper that, that sort of makes you realize that there's a world of evidence-informed education out there and the possibilities that that entails. So what was your research Thunderbolt? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. So for, for listeners who don't know, I, I'd not read a piece of education research for the first 12 years of, of, of my career. And then I started my Mr. Barton Maths podcast and that let, that opened my eyes into to a world of research because my guests like Dylan William would come on and mention all these things. And I was like, what? I'd never heard of them at all. So I'd go away and read them. And then, you know, Daisy Christodoula would talk about something. I'd go, go away and read that. I think the cliched answer, but it's cliche because it's true, and I'm sure lots of people say this, is, is Willingham's, you know, why students don't like school, and maybe we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. So in terms of a book, that was the single biggest impact for me. In terms of a paper, it's probably, um, and there's, there's a few versions of this, but I, I've got my favourite. It's, it's the Bjork's work on desirable difficulties. By far and away, the most accessible paper for that is, it's a really weird one. It's, it's kind of a conversation. It's an interview between, uh, it's an interviewer, and then Robert and Elizabeth Bjork are answering questions. And for a simpleton like me, it's really easy to digest because it's just dialogue. It's just they're asking, you know, what's the most important thing you did in your research? And you just read it. It's like, a, you know, a transcript from a, from a podcast interview. And it covers all the biggies. So it covers the testing effect. It covers the spacing effect. It covers interleaving. And maybe, again, we'll, we'll revisit interleaving because I've got a funny relationship with interleaving. We'll come back to that, Kieran, because I've, I've, I've misinterpreted that for, for many years. But it covers all it, – it was the first time that I really realized that – it wasn't as simple as saying struggle is good. It was a specific kind of struggle because I'd always been under the interpretation. The harder you make kids work, the more they learn. But it was the Bjork's paper that made me realize, no, that those difficulties need to be desirable. And I need to really think what's the most appropriate time to do this. I've got to communicate that to my students and then I've got to implement it effectively. So that was a, that was a game changer for me. And then I was lucky enough to interview them for, for my podcast. And that's, that's something that I've revisited. I've revisited that podcast a few times and I always take something new out of it as I, as I read more and, and so on. So if I was to pick one, it'd be the Bjork's work on disabled difficulties. And in particular, that kind of conversation piece, I, I think it's a really accessible piece of work. That. Yeah. And, and that's fantastic because if you can get into you know, some of the best research, well, I don't know, if maybe adding a value judgment isn't fair, but, you know, I, I'm certainly a big fan of their work and I think it's really important in the classroom. And if you have that entry way into it, you know, via a dialogue between two people, then I think it, it makes it both more accessible, but also higher likelihood that more people will engage with us. That sounds fantastic. And I mean, I first read about desirable difficulties in about 2014-15. But it was a long time after before I realized how I could use that in the classroom. And it was when I put it together with the idea of responsive teaching and, how, and the, the difficulty being relative. So it, it took maybe another four or five years of reading before I could actually do anything with that one. Yeah, it's a biggie. And just, just the whole notion as well that's tied it to speak about performance and learning in there. And that was a bit that was a big one for me. When I when I read about the distinction between performance and learning, there was, there was, there was the thing that should have been obvious that I didn't realize, and that's performance and learning are different. But then there was the subtle thing that still baffles me to this day, that when you create conditions that lead to high performance, they may be detrimental to long term learning. And that I think that's a real profound insight. And that that really has implications for how I teach, particularly when I think of scaffolding. You know, scaffolding sounds great, but if you don't remove that scaffolding, you're always going to be getting high performance, but your kids aren't going to be learning. And so that. That, that whole work, I just think is fantastic. But yeah, desirable difficulties in performance learning, I think it's really profound stuff. Yeah, if we're talking about Thunderbolts, you know, high performance was essentially the, the, the target when I came into the profession, maybe about 2008. It, it was performativity yeah. over, over anything else, really, you know, so 
I think that it probably shook a lot of people. I think, and just the final, final word on that, it, the kids need to know, because if you're going to be shifting your teaching in a way that performance is going to dip, they need to know why you're doing it, that it's got this long-term payoff. Otherwise, performance dips, and then if effort dips, which is you know a natural thing to happen, as they think, well, why am I bothering here? I'm, I'm no good at this. Then you don't get that long-term learning. So that communication to the students, that's often the missing piece, I think. You know, Teachers were a much more re research-informed profession now, but are our kids more research-informed? If they don't know why we're doing the things we're doing, we're missing the key piece in the puzzle, because it's not us who needs to learn stuff, it's, it's our students. So particularly with performance and learning, that feels like a, an important part that, that, that I, I think is often left out. That's a wonderful thunderbolt. You know, I can totally see where you're coming from, and I think it's very difficult to get an original thunderbolt. And but you've you've managed it. So oh. I think um, <laughs> the people listening will be very happy to uh, to have somewhere new to go. And um, because quite often we'll end up talking with the same papers. But uh, yeah, that's that's you know, something that uh, I think people are really interested to learn about. It, it can be tough to engage with research. What's your approach? And in particular, how did you do it when you were a class teacher? Yeah, so I was fortunate in the sense that I'd started the podcast. The podcast was my gateway into it. So I was in a school where, and I think this was this was no no disrespect to the school. This was just the way it was at that time, where there wouldn't have been anyone else in my department who'd be reading research. And I think you'll do well these days to find that to be the case in, in, in many schools. So it wasn't like I was having conversations with, with, with anybody about it, but I was having conversations on my podcast. So that helps, and that gave me a way in. That, that gave me, you know, if, if Dylan Williams tells you to read something, you might as well just stop what you're doing and just, just read it. So that, that, that really, really helped. I think now when I, when I speak to te busy, busy teachers who, who are overwhelmed by everything that's out there, I think there are two strategies that, that, are, that are quite useful. Um, one, Sarah Cotting, the first Sarah Cottingham shared on, on my Tips for Teachers podcast, and she said, go out and look for something well, in kind of two ways. So first, look for something that builds on something you're already doing. So if, for example, you, you know, you, you're checking for understanding regularly, but you just want to improve a little bit on it. Find some research on that because that you've got an interest. You've got it. You've got a, You've got a way. You, you're a step on the ladder already there. So find research that fits into something you're already doing and can maybe enhance that a little bit. I think that's, that's smart. Or take the bold step and find research that is targeted into something in your teaching that you've identified as a weakness. So if, you know, the converse, if you've, you've been told many times or you've figured out yourself you're not good at checking for understanding, well, what does the research say about checking for understanding? I think that's more useful than just kind of hoping stuff falls in your lap or, you know, clicking on the first thing that you see. Having a focus to it, I, th I think, is smart. And I like that distinction. Either something that you're already doing that you want to improve or something that you know you need to improve. So let's, let's kind of dive in. I think that's a good idea. And the second idea is... Just curators, P pick somebody good who's doing the legwork for you. So, you know, the problem with this is, you've, you know, everybody's got their biases and so on, but I think it's better than nothing. So Tom Sherrington would always be a go-to for me and read every blog he, he posts. That's, that's normally a smart idea. I'm a big podcast fan, so Ollie Lovell would be a good one for me. Um, somebody who's, who's, who you trust their opinion. You know, you're not going to 100% follow everything they say, but you, they've got a decent track record of coming up with the goods. Let them do the legwork and then you just kind of, you know, enjoy the fruits of their labor. And I think I think podcasts are just great for this. Right. If you've got a commute to work or you go for a walk or whatever, or you're doing the dishes or whatever it may be, just sticking somebody in your ear. And, you know, if it's in 20 minutes, you're probably going to pop a bit of gold. And I this is a big claim, but there'll be some podcast episodes where they've taken me an hour to listen to whilst I've been doing a run or whatever. And I've learned more from them than I have from reading an entire education book or 10 research papers or whatever, because it's, yeah, it's just, it's actionable. There's something about the audio format as well that's accessible. So yeah, that'd be, that'd be my advice. Either focus it on something you need to do or find a high quality curator who you trust. And I think that's probably your best way in. That, that, that's what I do anyway. I don't know if we mentioned it whenever we last spoke on tips, but I used to listen to maybe an episode a week of yours. You know, I think my journey worked out that you divided <laughs> into 10 parts. Yeah. You, had an, you had an episode. <laughs> and I, I remember sitting listening. And there would be sometimes I just sit in the car park because the question needed to, I needed to hear the answer to the to the question because yeah I mean I I, I think I came across it by chance but it it just changed the game because this whole world you know where you had these people talking about um, things that you're interested in but had no idea about you know it, it does it makes things you know because 
I think it's easier to find time to listen than it is to find time to read sometimes, you know. I know we should do both. But um yeah, you know, so you know, we always talk about the, the massive depth of profession which you correct, but it's, <laughs> it's not to be understated. <laughs> That's very kind. Do you have any systems in place for testing the quality of what you read? I mean this comes up in the EEF's report, you know, Sam Sims uh, sort of co-authored this uh, meta-analysis and they said use trusted sources what do you do to make sure yeah, your sources I'm, I'm are going to be completely they? honest here I'm, I'm bad at this but I'll tell you why I'm bad at this so um, just to reference Ollie Lovell um, again he did a wonderful kind of double, ep- double episode where he interviewed John Hattie about his visible learning and meta-analysis and effect sizes and that like a few years ago that was the go-to source right you know like everything you do it you would do it had to have an effect size or whatever it was and you could justify it it's almost like you know a tick list i'm doing this today so it's because you've got an effect size of 0.6 and i'm doing this and so on i think oh amazing so i listened to um i listened to ollie interview john hattie but <laughs> the flip side of that he has another episode with a guy just slagging off effect sizes and meta-analysis and say it's all absolute nonsense so as soon as i heard those I thought, you know what, who am I to judge the quality of research? I mean, you can do things like if you look at a research paper and the sample size is like, you know, 37 kids in a selective school. I have a bias here, but I'll just admit it. Um, Productive failure is an interesting one. Um, The idea of productive failure is that struggle is actually quite good. You give kids something that you know they're not going to be able to answer. But that struggle, then when you actually, you know, teach them the way to do it, that initial struggle has actually helps them learn it better. It sounds great, right? You read the research studies into this. <laughs> there are, and people slag me off for this, but again, we'll, we'll just go for it. They're all, without fail, they're all done with high achieving students. Um, so you get kids in, you know, independent schools or whatever, sample size of 32 kids or whatever. And of course, those kids, they've got this bedrock of success. They're used to, in their heads. They're used to, if I struggle on something for 10 minutes, it's okay because eventually I know I'm going to get it because I always get things in the past. But you then try and apply that to your year 10 class who are, who hate maths, who've failed at maths for 10 years, and you say, right, we're going to struggle on this for 10 minutes. I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. They're going to be chucking stuff at you. It's not going to work. So I think there are certain things like that. When you read the abstract, it's always worth just having a quick look at the sample size and the context. I think that's always a smart thing to do. But above and beyond that, I'm no good at this, Kieran. I'm no good. And that's, again, that's where I turn my head to smarter people like Dylan, like Tom, like Ollie. If they suggest something's worth reading, I'll probably trust them. That, that's about as sophisticated as I get on this. I think it's about all we can do, really. I mean, I ask Chris such, Chris, what do you think of this paper? But I do also look at the context. There's, um, there's a paper that suggests that symbolic notation, so say 2 plus 2 plus 2, is more effective than using Cuisinart rods to model the same uh, sort of concept. And so it showed that it, it, this was set up as quiz neuro is less effective than straightforward, tell the kids the answer kind of thing. Um, but what it turned out was, again, it was it was affluent children. Yeah. And the authors had put in this bit, but whenever it got recited, that didn't get mentioned. Yes. And I, I sort of looked at it and went, these aren't the children I'm working with. The children I'm working with are coming in with next to no mathematical understanding when they're three years old. Um, it's not fair because I've seen my own kids and, you know, just playing board games with them. You know, you can see them pick up the maths. Like yesterday, my oldest picked up the division with remainders just by playing a game where we had to, all of the numbers of uh, diamonds we had to share were odd, but we had four players. Nice. And so I said, well, do you know your times tables? Can, you know, and then extrapolate from there. You know, he didn't require any teaching, you know, but that's not the norm, you know. Yes. And that's fortunate kids with mathematically rich upbringings yes I'm, I'm totally with you on that one what's the most important lesson you think we can take from the field of cognitive psychology or cognitive science anything that sort of explores the cognition of your people yeah this is where i'm going to have to be cliche and come back to willingham and i'm sure you've heard this answer many times but hopefully i can illustrate it with a couple of nice examples and it's this notion that memory is the residue of thought i don't think there's anything more and more important than that but it, it manifests itself in obvious ways and less so obvious ways so i'll describe if it's all right i'll describe two situations where, where I've, I've seen this so this is the obvious one. So um, many years ago, Danny Quinn, former head of maths at Michaela, came on my podcast. And I always ask, um, Mr. Bart Maths podcast, and I always ask my guests what's their favorite failure. And she described a brilliant lesson um, that I call the, the orange lesson. Now. And it was, um, she was going to teach the kids the formula for the surface area of a sphere. And this will be a low point if I get this wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's 4 pi r squared. And a, a kind of classic way to demonstrate this is you take something that looks a bit like a sphere, 
like an orange. You measure, before the lesson, you measure the radius of, of this sphere, which is hard to do anyway. And then you get four circles that have the same radius of this orange. And the idea is you should be able to peel that orange. And because the area of a circle is pi r squared, you should, the peel should exactly fit inside four of those circles. And there you go, a bit of real life maths. Everyone's having a great time. And you've demonstrated that the formula for the surface area of that sphere is four pi r squared. But of course it doesn't work. Because first, you know, it's not a sphere. Then how on earth do you try and measure it accurately with a, with a ruler? You get bits uh, bits overlapping, bit juice is squirted on the floor and so on and so forth. So two, two things happen as a result of that. First, the kids think this is an approximation. It's not an exact answer. And then, then you're in trouble. You get the same thing with like proving, demonstrating pi with string. It never works out as, as what you expect. Then to go back to Willingham's point, what are the kids thinking about? Are they thinking about the formula for the surface area of a sphere? Or are they thinking about how much they can squirt their mate in their eye with a bit, a bit of juice, you know, putting peel on the red and all this kind of stuff? That becomes the memorable thing that they, they take away. That, that resonates with kids, not the content of the lesson. So you get lots of these. That's, that's the obvious example. But here's, here's a more subtle one. So I saw this the other week. And I'm, I, it's my kind of go-to example now on this. So it's a bit of a secondary context, but, but fingers crossed it, it'll transfer across. So I was watching a lesson on the law of indices. So the point of the lesson was, if you have something like x to the power of 2 multiplied by x to the power of 5, the teacher wanted the kids to know that you end up with x to the power of 7. You, you add the powers. And when you divide, if you have x to the power of 8 divided by x to the power of 2, you get x to the power of 6. You subtract the powers. And finally, the power law, when you've got x to the power of 5 or to the power of 2, you multiply the powers, you get x to the power of 10. So teacher had done these worked examples on this, and then out comes the sheet. And the sheet consisted of three blocks of questions. Block A was all multiplication, was all um, the uh, addition law. So it was x to the power of 5 multiplied by x to the power of 2. y to the power of 6 multiplied by y to the power of 8. Block B was all the division stuff, where they had to subtract the powers, and block C was all the multiplication. So what was interesting is the kids, and it, it, was, it was unbelievable, this key room. The kids, when they got to the first question, they put their hand up, what do I do here, miss? And miss would come over and say, well, when, when it's got the multiplication sign, you add your powers. Oh, brilliant. And then off they would go, and it became an exercise in whether you could add together those numbers. And some of them were negative numbers, some of them were decimals, and the kids were then thinking hard about how do you add negative numbers? How do you add decimal numbers? Then they get to block B. Up the hands will go, miss, I'm stuck. What do I do for these? Well, when you divide, you subtract. All right, brilliant. And then they were off subtracting, and then they were getting stuck subtracting negative and so on. Now, I was fortunate enough to then go into that class, the next lesson, and in the do now was a retrieval starter, which had one of these questions in isolation, a, a division power one. Kids didn't have a clue how to do it. Why did they not have a clue, clue how to do it? Because what they'd been thinking about wasn't the laws of indices. It was the operations on these numbers. And I chatted to the teacher about this and said, well, what could we do instead? Well, we could have just had lots of questions where they were having to switch between the, the, the strategies. Sometimes they had to add, sometimes they had to subtract. So what they were thinking about was the law of indices. How do I know what law of indices to apply here? Whereas what, in fact, they were thinking about was the number operations that they were applying each time. They didn't have to think hard about the thing the teacher wanted them to think hard about. So often when we hear Willingham's quote, it's in the context of these kind of surface features that are distracting, the orange. I talk about Swiss rolls in my How Wish I Taught Maths. But I think actually there are some subtler versions of this where kids look like they're doing maths practice. There's no distracting context. But the thing they're thinking about is not the most important thing. It's not the thing that's going to make the difference to them. So for me, it would be Willingham, the obvious and the more subtle, if, if that makes sense. It makes total sense. And I really like the distinction that there, you know, between the, the levels of subtlety. Because then, would I be right in assuming that intelligent practice, as you've discussed in the past, would be your, your go-to for making sure that or not making sure, you know, attempting to guide people's attention. Is that where you go next? Yeah, it's a big, big part of that. Yeah, Kieran. Yes, it's, it's, it's a good point. So for, for those people who don't know, my variationtheory.com website has a lot of these sequences where you would have. So, yeah, let's take the law of indices. That's a really good, a good example. You may have x to the power of 2 multiplied by x to the power of 5. And then the next question, it may reverse that. So x to the power of 5 multiplied by x to the power of 2. So I want students, I've only changed one thing, I've changed the order. So I want students to realize there that the order doesn't matter when I'm multiplying. And then the next question might be x to the power of 5 divided by x to the power of 2. So now I've switched operations. So the only thing that's changed there is the operation switched. What impact does that then have on the method that have them on the answer? And then let's switch it around. X to the power of 2 divided by x to the power of 5. Now, it didn't matter. The order didn't matter when I multiply. But now, all of a sudden, the order matters when I divide. Why? So, yeah, I think that's where it can certainly help. Controlling the flow of information, changing a limited amount so students can 
observe what impact that change has on the output. I, I think that can be certainly one way of, of potentially tackling tackling this. Yeah, definitely. So it might have been a turn of phrase, but you said it's definitely a part of it. What would, what would the other parts be? How would your practice be informed by that? Yeah. So, well, if it, what I mean by that is intelligent practice, there's a lot more to it than that. It, I think it's quite easy to dismiss, as, as many people have, dismiss it as a load of boring old worksheets and so on and so forth. And indeed, the point I always make is, if you just give out a sheet of questions that are carefully varied to most kids, they will just become a boring old worksheet. For me, there's a type of behavior, mathematical behavior that underpins them. I call it reflect, expect, check, explain. I want them, before kids approach question three, I want them to look back at question two and question one and just reflect what changed, what stayed the same. Then I want them to form an expectation based on what I've observed. Can I form any expectation about what might happen here? Will the answer go bigger, smaller, negative, positive, work it out in a different way? Is there anything I can, anything, a basis of what I expect to happen? Then check. So actually work it out using the method you've been taught. And then the most important part, explain. If you're surprised by the answer, can you explain why? If you're not surprised by the answer, how would you explain it to somebody who was surprised by the answer? So I think you've got to get the sequencing of questions right. That's kind of tick one. Without that, it's, it doesn't work. But equally as important, but massively underappreciated, is supporting students in a certain way of approaching these questions. And for me, as I said, that's my framework. And I think that enables kids to get the most out of this, this type of practice. But as I say, a lot of people say I talk nonsense on this, Kieran. So uh, yeah, feel free to disregard that. I mean, yeah, you, you spend enough time online and someone's going to tell you you're talking nonsense anyway. I mean, as it happens, Chris and I have a, a fan club for that for your your second book. Um, we, we think it's the the standout maths book, particularly because it gives you this model um, and this sort of um, this sort of guide um, that I think is absent. You know, had you not written, so, you know, so we're, we're very appreciative of it. And we, we certainly tell as many people as possible that, uh, you know, they really should. Really I'm, I'm glad someone is keen because it's, I'm hoping in about 20 years, there'll be some kind of undiscovered classic or something. And I'll tell you where you'll discover it in the boot of my car, because I've got 20 copies in there just waiting to kind of be given away. So, yeah, I'm glad somebody likes it. That's that's, that's kind of saying it's too big. Like the point I'll tell you, if, okay, just go off topic just a little bit. The book's too big. The, the problem is I tried to do two things with that book. It was to talk about intelligent practice. But then the more I thought about this reflect, expect, check, explain framework, I thought, you know, that's quite powerful. That can, that can transcend quite a few elements of a sequence of lessons. Like worked examples, it's quite a good way for students to behave in a worked example. Like the teacher does one line and then they just pause and think, okay, what's he done there? What do I think he's going to do next? And then they do it. Can I explain why? So then I wove it into lots of different things. But then I thought, you know what? It's two years since I wrote How Wish I Taught Maths. I've learned a load of things from how teachers around the world have taken those ideas and applied them. Because I just wrote How Wish I Taught Maths with the experience of my own classroom. That's all I had to go off. But then with that book did very well. So lots of teachers read it and lots of teachers then applied the ideas and, and made them work in their context. So I thought, well, it seems mad not to kind of document a bit of that. And before you know it, 200,000 words later, I've got a big doorstop of a book that, you know, most people can't pick up, let alone read. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite I'm proud of it. It's too big. It's definitely too big. I think you're being too modest. I don't know if it's out of shot, but it's got prior to place oh, in my mathematics nice. section. Is of it my holding up other books? It's quite me. good at doing that. <laughs> It's sandwiched in between high wish I got maths <laughs> and teaching for mastery. Well, I was doing, I'll tell you what, I was doing, um, I spoke to Tom Sherrington and Emma Turner on their, on their podcast the other day, and I know you've been on that one, The Mind the Gap. And Tom Sherrington was having a bit of go at me about the size of the book. And he held up, he says, this is a proper book. And he held up one of his flipping, you know, research in action, con, you know, one of those ones. I said, that's more of a pamphlet than a book. Like, you could hardly see it next to mine. That's not a proper book. Anything under 100 pages, flipping it, forget it. So, yeah, you need, you need a big old chunky thing. Give people value for money, you know. Yeah, pa pamphlet is the exact word, and um, yeah, it's 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 quite prevalent. I mean, if, if it helps the dissemination of knowledge, then uh, by all means. But I I prefer the the much larger books as well, you know. And I I was quite nervous because I very crudely with reduced teaching down to uh, explain model practice, and then I was all thinking, well, actually, you know, this goes <laughs> almost. You know, it's almost overly simplifying, but, uh, you know, I thought that conversation went better than I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> Following on from the enormous success of the Mr. Barton Maths podcast, you've created the equally wonderful and useful tips for teachers. Where did the idea come from and what made you think of to take a more general but also specific 
uh, sort of approach. Yeah, so it's an interesting one, this. So, um, so I, I did, did the Mr. Mark Master podcast. I think first episode was end of 2016, something like that. So I did it for six years without... I mean, it's not dead in the water by any means, but I did it for six years without any kind of significant break, around about 200 episodes. And as you said, some of them are epics, like three hours, three and a half hours. Very rarely were they ever under two hours. They were, they were big old chunky things. And I had to do a fair amount of research for each one. Like if a guest had re written a book, I read the book cover to cover to get all the questions. And so on. they were quite, quite intense. <laughs> this, of course, this was pre-kids as well. This, this, this was the, the thing to say. Yeah, that's why I, I could, could get away with it. Um, but the other thing was, I, I, I intended it to be just a math specific one. I, I did it selfishly just so I could learn. Like the, the thing is, it'd be a bit weird if I emailed Dylan William and said, could we have a chat? But if I email him and said, do you want to come on the podcast? It's not quite as odd. So it was quite a good way to kind of meet and, and, and learn from my heroes. But very quickly, and I think it was all, I, possibly was the Dylan episode that I realized that this has got appeal beyond mathematics, this. And whilst I'm clueless about any of the subject, there are some key principles coming out here that, that are certainly going to apply. So I, then I started in, uh, inviting people on, you know, like Tom Sherrington, for example, who hasn't got a maths background, who, who had insights that I could learn from. And then more generalists like the Bjorks or, you know, Daisy Christie or whoever it may be. But I still, it was still a Mr. Martin Maths podcast. And it was great. Like, it got ridiculous number, like over a million downloads or whatever. But it was... It was, it was intense stuff, and it had that maths focus. And then I, I, I said to Mark, I'm just knackered. I'm just tired of, tired of doing these. I'm, 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 I'm losing my enthusiasm a little bit. So I was in the gym, and I was going doing a swim. And I just had this idea of, um, I, I like the idea of doing videos. Videos really appealed to me. I think I, YouTube, I think, since for, for in the last five years or whatever, the amount of quality stuff on there is just ridiculous. And I thought, you know what, there's, there's, there's potential here for, for these longer form conversations or, or these kind of PD to, to be on, to be on YouTube as well as audio. So at first I thought, well, should I just record some tips myself? But I thought I've only got about five or six of them. That'll be quite a short run series. So then I thought maybe I could interview people. And then I just got this idea that let's just frame it around five tips. What are your, what, what five tips would you share to teachers? And as, as you know yourself, because you've been on the show, I, I sent through, through a few suggestions, but I leave it completely up to guests to come up with whatever they want. And this is nice for a number of reasons. Um, selfishly for me, I don't have to do any prep. It's, it's great for that. But I think for listeners, it's, it's something different than what's out there at the moment, because each episode, you make, you can, I, I make it very clear in the show notes and very clear in the intro exactly what the five tips are. So you can think, you know what, there's only really tip four that's relevant. I'm a bit short for time here. I've only got time for seven minutes or whatever. Tip four sounds good. So I, I in Spotify, you just click on the tip and it takes you straight to it. Or I record the videos and you can, you know, just watch it. So teachers can go straight in and find the thing that they want to. That works quite well. But also, because I record the audio and the video, what a lot of, particularly maths departments are doing, and I hope this grows, is one teacher will listen to a tip driving to work or whatever, and then they'll think, you know what, I'd like to share that. My colleagues could do me watching that. So they send the YouTube clip round. Each tip has a video attached to it. And some maths teachers, some heads of maths, will set that as like a little homework before a departmental meeting. Everybody watch this 10-minute video, and we're going to discuss it in the meeting. Or lots of departments will just play a tip. You know, play Adam Boxer talking about whiteboards or whatever it may be. Tom Sherrington about talking about verbal responses. They'll watch it as a stimulus for their meeting and then discuss, going back to what we talked about before, what would I need to change to make this work for me? So I, I just love it as a format. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. I've recorded, at the time of recording now, I've got about 34 of them in the can, something like that. I'm going to stagger the release, but... People just keep saying yes to them, which is really, really nice. And nobody's repeated a tip yet. There's just a cover, as well as pedagogy, as well, as well as the usual things like retrieval practice. You've also got things on well-being and stuff and, you know, how to be a bit happier and better relationships with kids. It's just, it's just great. I'm, I, I love speaking to people. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's just nice. I always go into every interview thinking, this is what I've learned over the years, by the way, that Go into interviews. I think this works for conversations just in general. This is me attempting to be profound, by the way, Kieran. Here. But go into interviews always thinking, I'm going to learn something from this. The person I'm talking to knows more about quite a few things than I do. And my role here is to get as much of that out as I can. And that's, that's what I love doing. So everyone who's come on the show, it's just blowing my mind, the things. And hopefully it's a nice kind of shorter little bite-sized thing that, that, that people can get into. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, I think I think it's fantastic. And as I, you know, I'm a massive fan of the, the long form and I will spend a lot of time listening to audio 
generally. I don't like to, you know, for instance, do the dishes without having something to also listen to at the same time. But during my lunch break, I will often look for YouTube videos to have on the background because I meet at my desk. I don't necessarily want to think about what I've been thinking about that morning. Well, I can go and I, I actually recently watched Sonia and her, her tips, and but in, in small chunks over a couple of days. You know, I think that makes it so accessible um, because we are at the end of the day very reasonably time poor. Um, but there, there's there's so much value in it. And uh, yeah, I think it's a you know, stroke of genius is how <laughs> I would uh, describe the, the whole affair so far. <laughs> You're very good at adopting a humble stance, you know, despite being an expert teacher in your own right. I think the phrase that we sort of use would be, you know, you wear your intellect very lightly, you know, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's undeniable. And um, what have you learned from the interviews? And is there a tip that successfully changed your mind on a particular topic or approach? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. The, I mean, the intellect lightly, I'll, I'll take that, Kieran. I think it's more a light intellect than, than, than anything else. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's nice. Like, I, 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 I'm genu as I said right at the start, I'm genuinely curious. I just, I just love, love, like, why wouldn't you want to learn things, you know? Like, it's, just, and it's, it's just such a privilege. And I always, I, I, I said this when I spoke to Tom Sherrington, that I'm always grateful for Dylan William for, for coming on the Mr. Barton Maths podcast early because without his appearance... Like, I, I certainly wouldn't be where I am today, and I certainly wouldn't have had a chance to talk to every the, the people I've been able to talk to, because, like, you can't say, once Dylan's been on, you're going to say, yeah, because it's, you know, got a bit of, you know, pedigree to it and stuff. So I've, 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 I've been very fortunate with, with that, and I, I, I just, I, I get excited. When I look in my diary and I've got a conversation with somebody, I get excited, because I know I'm going to, I know I'm going to come away with, it, come away with something. If I was absolutely loaded, one thing I would definitely invest in was would be some kind of producer to do all the mixing, because particularly doing the videos, they are a pain, doing the cutting and uploading and descriptions and, and so on. So, yeah, maybe one day. I'd love to be able to just record and then just go and have a cup of tea, and then next day it's all on YouTube and Spotify and all that. But maybe maybe one day. But in terms of, in terms of tips... I am, I am, I'm changing my mind on a lot of things at the moment because I'm speaking to lots of people. So I'll give you a couple of examples. So one would be Sammy Kempner's probably been the interview that's made me think most about my practice. So if you the listeners want to wear, Sammy is head of maths at the Totteridge Academy in London, where Adam Boxer was the head of science. And now he's, uh, he's stepped down from head of science, but he's, he's still teaching science there. And Adam put me on to Sammy. And he also, um, he also suggested Sammy go on Ollie Lovell's podcast because Whilst Adam is very much direct instruction, Sammy does direct instruction, but also loads of group work. He's group work obsessed, and I'm a massive group work skeptic. And I, so I wanted to get Sammy on just to figure out what, what on earth he was doing. And the way he described group work in his maths lessons, the way everybody's accountable for everybody else, the, the way, like one of his tips was, like if somebody in a group gets a question wrong, he doesn't even look at them. He just looks at the rest of the members of the group and says, what's going on here? This is your fault what what have you been doing what you understand i don't care if you understand it why doesn't he understand it and this whole culture because that's why i've never been able to get group work working because there's always been one or two kids driving each group and you know three or four kids just sitting off having a rest but this culture where all right you figure it out yourself that's one job but the hardest job in the classroom is to make sure your mates understand it as well if you can get that right the, i think you're laughing you're laughing because you know, you've then got loads of people who are doing the explaining for you and, you know, doing the kind of, you know, almost like one-to-one -one tuition and so on. So listening to that has really changed my mind. And that's one of the reasons, I mean, I think this is going, well, you'll release this in academic year, the start of the 2022, 20, academic year. I'm certainly thinking for the following academic year that I want to, I want to perhaps not go back to full-time teaching, but certainly have regular classes because some of these ideas, I just, I just want to try them. I just, I just, I want that. I've never had that kind of culture. It's always been paired work and independent work. I've always shied away from group work, but having listened to this, I can see it. I can see it work. I can see it being a struggle, but I can see it working with that strategy that you hold the group to account and you follow through on those actions that then there's a sanction. If the member of that group doesn't understand it, the rest of the group staying back at the end or whatever it may be, it's going to be painful for a few weeks, but I can imagine the culture would pretty quickly, the norm would become, yeah, you know what, once I get it, I've got to make sure everybody else gets it. So that would be, that'd be one big area I've certainly changed my mind about. Um, I'll just give you one other example, then I'll shut up. Um, Michael Pershing, who I know you've had on your, your excellent podcast, um, he's, 
me and him disagree on quite a few things with regard to worked examples. And it's quite interesting. We've, we've both read the exact same research into worked examples, but come to very different conclusions. Michael does a lot of um, students study completed worked examples, whereas I do the kind of traditional roll out the worked example, where I do a line and then another line and then another line. And we've, we've over the years on, on my podcast, we've gone back and forth over the reasons for this difference. But he was on Tips for Teachers. And he said that during an explanation, he would always be asking kids questions, questions that he was confident they'd know the answer to. And I just thought, why? Why would you do that? Because during an explanation, you want the kids to focus. During the explanation, I want to give the kids the very best opportunity to understand what I'm saying. And then I'm going to check that understanding with mini whiteboards or whatever it would be. Whereas Michael's doing almost sounds like he's doing what I used to do when I first started teaching, where explanations are, what do you think I'm going to do next? Tom, what do you think? And, you know, wrong answers are flying around the room. But then when I re-listen to that, he's not quite, he's not saying that. He's, he's asking kids questions that he's confident they're going to get the right answer to. And he's doing it for two reasons. Well, three reasons, possibly. Doing it to connect the new idea to something familiar. So he's building up the explanation with a basis of things that they already know. He's doing it to generate confidence so the kids feel like already they're tasting success of this new idea. And he's doing it to keep engagement. He's doing it to make sure his kids keep listening all the time. And I thought, you know what? There's, there's a place for this. There's, there's a place. But I've got to try and reconcile that because also I think there also is a place for, right, shut up, listen. I'm going to do my best to explain this to you. So it's just trying to reconcile those two things. So that's why I like I like being challenged by smart people who think a bit differently to, to, to me, because there's all you can guarantee there's always somebody in there. And it's just then you've got to think, how does this fit into into my practice? So, so that there'd be two examples of, of fairly recent tips that I've um, I've certainly certainly kind of changed my mind a bit about, if that makes sense. Two brilliant examples, too, because they're two really big sort of mindset yeah. shifts, aren't they? You know, the, the distinction between Bruce and I. You're talking about visiting different teachers. Imagine getting into their classes yeah. and and seeing those in action. Absolutely. Tips for Teachers will soon become a book. We're really excited to hear. Now, this question isn't <laughs> cheeky. I ask it to Peps, ask to Chris, ask to Tom Sherrington, because I find it gives really good responses. So it's not me going on. <laughs> um, why, why does the world need this yeah, book? You know what, Ken? It's a question I wrestled with myself. So um, John Cart, my publishers, they, they, they often send me an email every kind of six months or so saying, have you got any more ideas? And for the last two years, I've just said no. Like, I've, 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 I've literally nothing. I've, everything went into that second book. I've nothing left to say. I've, I've peaked. But then I started doing tips for teachers, and it's the most excited I've been in five years. For, for, basically, since I started writing How Wish I Taught Maths. The only reason I wrote that book was because I, I was so excited. I was writing these things for myself. I thought, you know, there's probably there's a bit of a narrative structure in here. Maybe this will be useful. The, reflect, expect, check, explain. It was almost written quite defensively. It was written because people seemed to have missed what I was saying about intelligent practice. I was getting slagged off left, right and centre. And I thought, instead of trying to reply to all these emails and tweets, I'm just going to write something as comprehensive as I can and say, look, everything I think is in here. If you want to read it, read it. If you don't, that's OK. But don't keep asking me why I'm doing this. It's, it's all here. So I, I wrote that in quite a defensive, defensive way. Whereas now with these tips for teachers, and I, I, look, it, I sound like some, I, I was thinking about this. I, I'll tell you what I sound like here, Kieran, right? So I'm a big Oasis fan, and I'll never forget. So Oasis is, first album, definitely maybe, brilliant, right? Second album, What's the Story, Morning Glory, brilliant. Just before Be Here Now, the third album, was supposed to be the biggest, biggest album ever. And I remember watch. I was so excited about it, 97, I think it is, um, watching an interview with Noel Gallagher. I think Be Here Now, for what I remember, came out on a Thursday. On the Wednesday night, BBC had some Oasis special. And they're interviewing Noel Gallagher and they said, is this a good album? And he said, it's not a good album. It's the most important album ever made. And I was like, whoa, this is going to be good. And then I bought it the next day and, oh my God, I was listening to it thinking, what is this? What, what am I listening to here? And I've, I've revisited many times, and there's some good bits on it, but oh, it marked the beginning and the end. I mean, I still gave them 15 quid every time a new album came out or whatever, but, you know, that, that was it for me. And I'm, the problem I've got now is I'm really, I'm, I'm writing this book as we speak. In fact, I've just, just kind of finished draft one um, today, just before, just before we, we have this conversation. And I'm dead excited about it, Kieran. I, I 
think it's good and not because of anything I've done, because I'm just translating what people like yourself and other guests have, have, have come up with. I think it's really good, but I don't want to be Noel Gallagher. I don't want to put this out and it is a load of crap. So what I'm going to have to do here is just make sure that it is decent, like send it to a few people and blah, blah, blah. But the reason I think it's good and just to reiterate, that is genuinely not being me being cocky. I'm just the kind of facilitator of this. I've just literally, you know, put, put the words down that other people have said is because the, the, at the current time, there's about 107 tips in there broken up into different different categories. And you always see in books that you can just people always say in the intro, authors always say you can just dip into a bit that you want, you know, read it as a whole, but you can just dip in. But this you genuinely can, you know, like if, if you've got a lesson tomorrow and you just want to see, I'm thinking of using mini whiteboards. There's a, there's 20, 20, there's a, a tip called 20 ways to improve mini whiteboard use. So you just read through it. Or if you think tomorrow I'm going to use a diagnostic question, there's a, there's a tip called nine ways to improve your diagnostic questions use. And you can just, all right, yeah, I like that. I like that. You just dip in and dip out as and when you want. Like there's a narrative going throughout it. But yeah, I, I, I hope it's going to be a super practical, super, super practical book. Um, yeah, my, 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 my tagline to it is if you buy one practical book, make it teach like a champion. If you've got any money left for another, maybe consider buying this. But yeah, at the moment I'm excited. Whether I'll be Noel Gallagher in six months time, it's just, you know, got my head in my hands thinking, what have I done? You know, who knows, Kieran? But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see. <laughs> That's brilliant. I, I compare my books to Radiohead oh, nice, albums okay. so that I can just get stranger and stranger as we get older. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there'll be this weird avant-garde <laughs> seventh book. But but obviously we, we discussed this when I was on tips or during that, during that recording session. And I was thinking about it. It feels to me like the perfect book for those slightly more expert teachers who don't have a bespoke framework. You know, your early career teachers, they will have, you know, here are the things you need to know about education, but they still need targeted assignments to improve their practice, you know, in a, in a less formal manner. And I think, you know, if I've got 15 years experience, I open up a bit on, for instance, worked examples and, you know, and then you, you just, you're almost in charge of your development, but you're supported by someone more expert at the same time. That, that's what came to yeah, mind when I. That's good. Yeah. I like that. So I, again, the other thing I was thinking is, is who's the audience to this? And again, you all, you always get this. I mean, I've done this myself, right? You say, this is for everybody. You know, if you're a new teacher, read it. If you're an experienced teacher, read it, head of department, read it and so on. But I, I think you're right. I think this, to go back to what I was saying about Sarah Cottingham, I would imagine if you were a, a novice teacher, then what you might want to do, the way you might want to read this book, is you might want to take an entire chapter, like check for understanding. And within the check for understanding chapter, I think there's like 12 tips or something like that. And you might want to read that from start to finish because there's your framework. There, there's everything. Whereas if you're a more experienced teacher, you might just want to dip into one of those tips and just take a little bit from it just to try and tweak your practice a little bit. So, yeah, I, I hope. And the other thing, of course, is well, what, what I'm doing. I mean, I, I, I know this is probably boring people, but I'll just, I'll just tell you this, the structure of each tip. So everything, there's a hundred and however many tips in there. And it always starts with what's what's the problem? So I describe either a problem in my teaching or a problem I've seen when I watch others teach with what it related to the particular tip. And then the next bit is, what do you think? So I always ask two questions that get the reader to reflect on their own experiences, because I want to know where the reader is. And that replicates what I do in a CPD session. I always want people to just get a sense of where they are before I start kind of prattling on. And then it's, what's the tip? So I describe the tip, blah, 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 whatever, whatever it may be. And then the final two things are, there's the tip in a sentence. So if you just want a short summary, it's in a sentence. But then the big bit is called over to you. And I ask four questions. And I think these four questions are useful to ask for C people leading CPD, uh, people just attending CPD. I think these are quite useful things to ask. So the first one is, how close does this tip match my current practice? And I give kind of three things, not at all, somewhat, or I do exactly this, you know. So again, that, that gives teachers a sense of how big a change they would need to make. I think that's important because if you're circling a load of, I do nothing like this, and you try and change everything, it's going to be an absolute disaster. Whereas what I'm encouraging people to do is let's start with the tips where you do something a bit like this, because that's where you've, you've got that buy-in already. You can probably just tweak things a, a, a little bit. The next thing I ask is, what would I need to change to make this work for me? Now, we talked about this before. I think that's the most useful question you can ask yourself whenever you're listening to a podcast, reading a book, whatever it may be, attending CPD. What would I need to change to make this work for me? The third question I ask is, when am I going to try this for the first time? 
And what I, what I put after that is be as specific as possible because there, there's fascinating research into this. Um, next next term never happens. Next week probably won't happen. Wednesday period three is going to happen. So I want people to commit. And again, I'm going to talk to John Cat whether I, you know we make this almost kind of like a field book where people are writing in here. You know, I'm going to do this blah blah blah. Where and when to so commit to it. That's called the implementation action. And then the final one, the fourth one, is to come back to it. So when you've tried it, what worked, what didn't work, what you're going to do differently next time. That, that moment of reflection. And I think the danger is, and this is no fault of it, I think my books have fallen into this trap as well. A lot of books can be a fairly passive experience where, you know, you read through them. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But if I can then force people to engage at the end of the tip with some of the things they're actually going to do, then I hope that makes it a bit more actionable. And, and you know, there's a hundred and however many tips in there. So hopefully that's a lot of, you know, a lot of ideas that people can try out and, and hopefully have a meaningful uh, impact. And then the last thing I put at the bottom is resources. So I'm very fortunate that I can then link to a page where I've got videos of the people describing the tip. I can link to various bits of research, activities, whatever it may be that then kind of underpin if people want to go that stage further there's other bits they can follow up so as i say i'm very very excited about this kieran but i, I don't want to get too excited just in case it, it falls flat on its face and my, my car my uh, car boot gets full of copies of these as well so we'll we'll see <laughs> what you're describing is something that can become part of people's practice and their professional development behaviors and the more we can do to support people in developing those behaviors you know in a positive way i think you know, the better. So I'm really looking forward to its release. I mean, what, what time frame are you working to? You know, obviously we're in August. No, yeah, still well, July. the thing is, I've written it very, and, and you've got draft very quickly. One. The, the reason I've written it, I'm, I'm quite a quick writer anyway, but I um, I do a Tips for Teachers newsletter um, and I write up a tip every week or every other week. So I've written a load of these up anyway. So I, I had a fair few to, 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 to kind of put together, but I'll tell you the problem. And again, we're recording this at end of July. I've got a call with John Cat next week, and that's what I'm going to tell him. It's 135,000 words to this, this book, and that's where the problems are going to start, right? Because not only is it 135,000 words, if I want teachers to write in it, that's, a, that's an extra page per tip. So that's an extra 100 and however many pages added on to this. So God only knows what's going to happen. But the thing is, I want this to be good. So even though I've written it now, I'll tell you the exact process I'm going to go. So starting next week, I would take a few days off, but starting next week, I'm going to reread it from start to finish, trying to cut things down, make it as concise as possible. I'm then going to do something that I think is quite, oh, again, just I'll nerd out on this a little bit here. And I'm a bit obsessed with, um, with listening to writers' podcasts at the moment, how people write particularly nonfiction. So a few tips I've picked up on this. So when I do the reread, next week i'm going to read it out loud first this this seems this tip comes up time and time again if you if you read it out loud that's when you spot words that don't belong sentences that are too long things that just don't make sense i'm going to read it out loud so i'm going to do that and um, i have write in google docs so i'm going to read it on my ipad and then i'm going to have a copy of it on my desktop here so every time i read a crap bit i'm going to then jump on my computer and make changes so i'll read it from start to finish but then i'm going to do something i've never done before and i think this will be quite an interesting exercise I don't know if you find this, Kieran, but every time I'm lucky enough to do a talk or training for teachers, sometimes I'll say something that I don't even know where it came from. It'll just be in my head somewhere. And you know, I think, you know, I was actually quite good that I don't know why I wasn't planning on saying that. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to record essentially CPD sessions on each of the chapters in the book. Probably not. They'll probably never see the light of day, but I just want to pretend I'm doing the talk on them. And then hopefully I'll either say things in a better way or a more concise way or in an alternate way that then can enhance the book. So once I've gone through that process and then done another rewrite based on that, then comes the big one. And I'll probably send it out to a few people. And what I'm thinking of doing there is probably putting a call out on Twitter. because I want practicing teachers to read this and just say, do you fancy reading a chapter of this book and, you know, offering some kind of incentive or something like that. And then when it's ready, I'll send it to John Cat. So hopefully some point in, It'll be with John Cat by the end of 2022, and then it's just whenever they get the lorries in to pick up the big things, it'll be flipping massive, and then we'll uh, yeah, we'll see when it can hit the shelves. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah, my brain's a liability sometimes during talks because oh, I didn't mean to say that, and <laughs> yeah, am I yeah. in trouble for saying that? <laughs> but I, I look like I'm, I look like it's some kind of flipping um, teenager when I'm doing a talk. So I've always got my phone with me because I'll, I'll I'll say something. I say just hold on, everybody. I'll just type it up, saying you know what, that that's that's good that. But yeah, I'd say. I'm not saying everything I say is good. I'd say that's about 2% of the things I say. But every now and again, it's weird in it how the brain works. Just something pops out that you have no idea where it came from. And it, yeah, sometimes it's useful. It, it's been brilliant talking to you today, Craig. I mean, if I could, I'd go on for several hours more. But <laughs> you've got a family to get back to. Um, 
all set to do set. Thank you very much for joining. No, me. it's, 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 it's my pleasure. pleasure. And I'm, well, a couple of things just just to say back. I'm I'm a huge fan of I'm a huge fan of your work generally, but particularly your podcast. I've I've certainly learned learned a lot. As you know, I've had you and, and Chris on on my tips for teachers, and it goes back to what we were talking about before, right? Like the more primary and secondary can collaborate, the more they can learn from each other, and I've I've, I've certainly learned a load. And yeah, I know that you've um, you've kind of you've got this relationship with Michael Pershing now. He's been on the show. Come back anytime, Michael, and so on. I want to I want to you know put my hand up as well. Anytime you want me back on to chat, I'm 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 more than happy. And so I love nothing more than kind of debating these things and so on and so forth. So it's yeah. I, thank you for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, that, that is awesome. That's music to my ears because we just literally have a a Wednesday night bat signal. <laughs> who wants to be on the show, the show tonight? <laughs> You know, here, here's the theme. Who, who wants to great. come and talk? You know, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you.